Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are going to talk about a topic uh, that, to our astonishment, we have never addressed mm -hmm. before. And the name of this topic is Dragons. Uh, and thank you very much to the listener who wrote in and said, how come you haven't ever discussed this? So dragons, as it turns out, are universal products of mythology, the imaginal, unconscious. There are dragon stories, dragon images, dragon myths on all continents except Antarctica. Um, and who knows, we may discover that the penguins have their own dragon mythology <laughs> somewhere down the line. Um, so here is a major uh, product of the mythical mind and uh, we will address the questions of how and where dragons are alive inside us. So, so this is interesting because the existence of dragons in pretty, pretty much every culture, and I'm, I'm going to unpack a little bit more about that in a, in a second, uh, really is perhaps evidence for the existence of the collective unconscious, right? So when we talk about mm -hmm. the collective unconscious, we talk yeah. about this universal substrate that has a tendency to generate similar images across times and cultures. So, so if there were ever, uh, you know, an image that kind of fit this category, I think dragon is it. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of this book called An Instinct for Dragons by an anthropologist named David E. Jones. And he says... There are dragons in every culture, including the Inuits, who don't, who've never seen a reptile. Yeah. And, and so why? And his hypothesis, by the way, I just think it's really interesting, is that dragons represent an amalgam of the principal predators of ancestral humans. So that, it, in yeah. other words, it's a sort of evolutionary thing. It's like, oh, watch out for scaly yeah. things, um, things with long tails, uh, you know, things that breathe fire. <laughs> Things but, you know, watch out you. for these things, right? Yeah. And I think uh, Carl Sagan also had, a uh, scientist, um, mm -hmm. also had a similar idea that we have what he called fossil memories um, yeah. that, that might be related to creatures that are alive today, like lizards or uh, komodo dragons, snakes, alligators. And I think there is That's something to, to this. Because I'm remembering that a while back we did a, an episode on alligators and crocodiles, mm -hmm. and those show up a lot in dreams a of lot. people that have, you know, live I've in areas where yeah. we know about them, but we have no real lived experience with them. But I also think it's what you said, Lisa, of there's somewhere in the collective unconscious, in the imagination we recognize dragons. Yeah. They're just there. And, and of course, the other appealing hypothesis that I, I just have, because I, I'm definitely one of those kids who like loved, I loved dinosaurs when I was a kid and I never, <laughs> I never grew out of that. I still love dinosaurs. And of course, you know, and it, it's so intriguing because you, you go to the museums and you, you, and you see the, the fossils and, and you think about these enormous bones poking out of the ground that people at some point, you know, in places like the Gobi Desert or something or different parts of the world found these. And like, how could they not hypothesize the existence of dragons based on to the extent that they ever found those? So that, that's a, a popular and, and to me an interesting hypothesis as well. But I, I never heard that about fossil memories, but that's I think that's very similar, actually, to the idea of the collective yeah. unconscious. Yes, yeah. exactly. 
uh, we need dragons. Mm -hmm. And that's why on six continents, there are stories about dragons. So it, it makes it all the more interesting that this vestigial memory of anything that could prey upon us as human beings and how we might escape that or kill it. Now, in the general psyche on the planet, dragons have become allies, ah. friends, protectors, war machines, magical, um, mm -hmm. and that human beings have this relationship and I guess in Game of Thrones, this capacity to master right. the dragons, to Only master some. the dangerous. Only, Only some. some. But, but that seems like quite a right. remarkable evolution. Mm -hmm. yeah. That we don't have to kill them, quote unquote, anymore. That we can have a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you're hitting on the major question is, um, since dragons are there as the quintessential emblem of fantasy. Now, what is it that we do? Uh, how do we relate uh, to a dragon? Do we kill it? Do we communicate with it? Do we befriend it? Do we master it? What is the right relationship uh, with a dragon? Well, maybe we should talk first about what dragons signify. And they, they, it's a wide range, like mm -hmm. many of these big symbols. Yes. I am looking something up here, but go ahead, Deb. What I think where the main divide is, uh, historically and culturally, is um, the divide between East and West. Mm -hmm. um, in Western lore, mythology, etc., uh, the dragons are are enemies, and they represent often chaos and untamed, uh, cold, unrelated, dangerous uh, energy, greedy. greedy. Um, they hoard. They do all these things. So they're basically they're in the enemy camp. Something of insecurity and fear represented as a dragon that that has to be conquered, whereas overall, um, in the East, uh, China, Japan, uh, the dragon is a very, very positive symbol. Mm -hmm. um, only the emperor was allowed to have dragon emblems on, on clothing or other places, and that uh, dragons represent um, transcendent, uh, glorious uh, powers uh, that are not accessible or part of the provenance of, you know, sort of ordinary mortals. I think that the dragons in the West seem to be this amalgam of personal failings, that all the seven deadly sins are <laughs> something that dragons do, which also anthropomorphizes them. I mean, there are these big reptiles but they're greedy, and they're greedy for things that human beings want, like gold, and they're not greedy for things that they might munch on, like cattle. <laughs> so, and they, they grab princesses, and God knows what they do with them, but they want all of them. Yes. Dragons have a thing for princesses, and it has to be a princess. Right. Um, not <laughs> but they're it's all not a shepherdess. Because, they're all human <laughs> desires that yeah, the dragon yeah. has in exaggerated excess. Yeah. There, there actually aren't that many fairy tales that contain dragons. I mean, mm -hmm. we think of that as the kind of quintessential fairy tale image, but I think in Grimm's there may be a dragon or two, but there's not, there's not a ton of dragons in Grimm's. Yeah, there's only one story in Grimm's that I found, mm -hmm. uh, which, which has to do with a boy and, and his uh, grandmother, uh, where mm. um, he has to track the dragon down and there it is lurking in a cave, um, and, the, and the dragon's grandmother uh, helps him. Mm -hmm. But you're right, there's not a lot. But I wanted to backtrack for a second. Okay. Of these two um, aspects, I think, of the archetypal image of the dragon that are represented by East and West, mm -hmm. and that we know, 
you know, archetypal images have both a positive and a negative valence from the point of view of ego. So in the West, uh, that aspect of the dragon that's negative, enemy, chaotic, um, and uh, unconscious uh, has been used as a basis for many a myth. Mm -hmm. And in the East, the positive, glorious, golden, transcendent, uh, flying aspects of the dragon uh, have been seized on by the collective imagination. And and in the East, they're really an image of the life force. Of the self, absolutely. The images uh, from the East of dragons, and there are dragon dances and paper dragons and so on, those images are beautiful beyond uh, almost anything. Uh, you can see that artist after artist has had a wonderful time on on China embroidery, um, ceramics, uh, with with dragon images. And what I would submit is that in Europe. You know, the European culture has been so defined by Judeo-Christian mythos, and Judeo-Christian mythos is tied to the Middle East. And the primary representation, the ancient representation of the dragon in the Middle East is the goddess Tiamat, yeah. who defeats Marduk. No, Marduk and, kills Tiamat. <laughs> oh, excuse me, challenges yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Marduk. Yes. But that the goddess uh, Tiamat, is malevolent, chaotic, destructive, dangerous, threatens all order and all life. And well, so, that's, so that's part of that Middle Eastern archetypal structure, which I would imagine also influences some of the, the mythos that comes from the Middle East through Judaism and into European culture. The one so, feeling that I have. Tiamat is a really important dragon image, and she's a Babylonian goddess. She's also a creatrix, so she gives birth to the other gods, but she's associated with the salt water. She's a kind of personification of the, of the waters, but she, she is an image, as you were saying, Joseph, she's really an image of kind of primordial chaos. Right. And that's why when, when Marduk defeats her, it's this image that we find again and again and again in mythology. That, that corresponds, you know, in a, in a, you know, in a Jungian interpretation, it really kind of corresponds to the development of the ego that arises out of the maternal chaos of the unconscious. So it's, it's sort of the, um, uh, the championing of the ego over the unconscious, which is, which is an important early stage of development. We have to constellate an ego out of the primordial ocean of the unconscious. So it's a universal thing that hopefully we all do. Um, but, but it, uh, it, you know, I think, Joseph, your point about the Judeo-Christian tradition is really important too, because especially in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we really sort of demonized that primordial mother and and she becomes associated with evil. And so then you get stories like St. George and the Dragon, you know, which is really about defeating that and keeping it down. It's this really ambivalent relationship that uh, the West has with the, um, I want to say, the kind of creative feminine principle, which is often read as threatening. Well, that idea of the creative feminine, I think, drops out a little bit when we get to St. George and the Dragon. It seems more that, that the Judeo-Christian world, as it manifests in Europe, has become so anti-instinct, anti-body, yes. Yes. anti-sex, yep. and all of the seven deadly sins, which are basically come out of the body in its fight to thrive in a lot of ways, eat as much as you can, reproduce as much as you can, protect yourself as much as you can. Yeah. All that stuff needs to be sublimated in one sense. And this is even part of the ancient world, the Code of Hammurabi, that at some point, in order to have a civilization, there need to be rules of conduct, yes. if nothing else, that we can't respond from pure animal instinct and still tolerate these complicated civilizations that we're embedded in. 
So I think the rise of this need to contain the first impulse, or what we might say is an antisocial impulse, and for that to be symbolized as the defeat of the dragon, which comes to be called Satan with the, in Christianity, it is part of that civilization so different. I'm not familiar with the evolution of the image of the dragon, but in the East, the idea of the taming of the instincts and putting them in service to life. Such a different approach, but I don't know how they got to that and whether it was, I would imagine it was a little more turbulent than the, than the end, elegant end product of that. Well, and I, I don't think, and I might be wrong about this, but I don't think the dragons in these are without ambivalent, you know, some ambiguity. They're dangerous. I think, right, they're dangerous, right? They're not pussycats. And they're not human. No, and they, they have a lot of resemblances, you know. They're, uh, we have lots of characteristics of dragons, um, what they're like, what they do. And in the East, they have stag horns, camel head, serpent neck, the belly of a clam, of all things, scales of a, of a carp, tiger feet, cow ears, eagle claws, and they're reaching for the moon pearl of wisdom. They're, they're also associated with rain and mm -hmm. um, having power over the rain. And so we get uh, dragon dances. And now today and throughout time, there have been um, dragon boat races. But they are associated with auspicious power. But I think the theme running through this part of our discussion is, what is the relationship between the ego and the unconscious? Right. Right. And, and I want to just, I have a quote here from Yolanda Jacobi, who writes, The creation of the world through the dismemberment of the maternal dragon is therefore the archetypal ground pattern for the task of the first phase of individuation. So that's kind of what we were saying before, that you've got to, you sort of have to defeat the dragon in some sense, this mother, the mother dragon, the mother unconscious. Right. And so what that means to, to put it down into our own lived experiences. When we think of the mother, the mother, that's from the perspective of the infant. So, you know, we're born and we're just piles of howling instinct without any regulation, and we have to be helped and raised. But that first experience of the newborn infant to the mother is a realm of overwhelming instinct. And because those um, pre-verbal memories are still alive in all of us, that there is a beckoning, that that primal early image of the mother beckons us to become howling infants once again. Mm -hmm. So to defeat the mother is actually to defeat the attraction to wanting to collapse back into yes. that howling yes. state. Yes. This kind and of then, regression. Yes, we lose consciousness, and then we start behaving in all kinds of illegal and devastating ways. So what we're really fighting, which is something to think about, is the desire to fall into the dragon, to nurse at the dragon, to become a, a child, once again, a dangerous child. And that's, that is what... Jung basically says is that when fighting the dragon, we are fighting the temptation to, to regress. You have uh, some good quotes there, don't you? Yeah. The, um, and so we have the dragon, the regression, or a symbol of regression, and then we have the hero. And Jung says the hero represents the good, favorable action of the unconscious while the dragon is its negative and unfavorable action. Not birth, but a devouring. Not a beneficial and constructive deed, but greedy retention and destruction. And our heroes, and they're always uh, male heroes, um, are, uh, have to face that challenge of early adulthood um, by facing those chaotic, primal, regressive tendencies of the unconscious and to develop boldness and courage 
and stand against the, those forces of of chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, just to kind of translate that, it's such a great, great quote. But to sort of translate it, say, you know, you have a young person who's uh, about to finish college and has no idea what he wants to do. He, you know, he doesn't have any plans. He doesn't have a job, and so. The regressive tendency would maybe be to, you know, see if he could stay in college longer. Maybe he can, you know, engineer some way to add on an extra semester, for example. And, you know, the images of what he's going to do afterwards is like, well, maybe I'm going to move back home. And, and it's this, it's a, a kind of regressive, regressing back to a childlike state of dependence or staying in a childlike state instead of overcoming the fear you know, Jung talks in, in volume five, he talks about fear a lot because what we have to do to face the dragon is overcome our fear. And, and in the battle with the dragon, um, this is another short quote from Jung, the hero has much in common with the dragon he fights, or, mm -hmm. or rather he takes over some of its qualities, invulnerability, snake's eyes, etc., so if you can fight the regressive tendency, um, it's empowering. And uh, there again, I think we see the opposites. And um, that one is, is it looks like it's being defeated, but in the defeat, the hero absorbs some of those qualities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Becomes more dragon-like. Exactly. Uh, uh, now you too can breathe fire. <laughs> so the example that you had given, Lisa, is um, a collapse into a kind of a passive dependency on the mother. Yes. yes. But also, depending on how far we regress, we also can regress to a more borderline state, which is a chaotic state, which is even more dangerous. And then we're in the world of the self-saboteur. Why is it that things are going well and something wells up in front inside of me and I have an impulse to say something that's going to create chaos or to be provocative in some way or to make infantile demands and to foster a kind of chaotic wildness in my relationship, at work, at school? And that's also this unfortunate regression to that very, very, very early state, which isn't as peaceful as wanting to play video games in the basement, but is actually much more terrifying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the other side of the dragon is also, as we were saying, um, the dragons can have a protective aspect that in Hinduism, Naga is a uh, a central figure in Buddhism that is the protector of those who are in right relationship. She is, she is a goddess of water and fertility and the earth and wisdom, and she protects the treasures, material and spiritual. So I think later in life, once we've kind of differentiated from the seduction of the dragon, we can have a relationship with the unconscious, and the unconscious is also the source of creativity and treasures and instincts that can save your hide. Right, like if we know it's not going to devour us, then we can, we can harness ourselves to it in a way that's incredibly powerfully creative, which I think is part of the appeal of uh, shows like House of the Dragon, which was the kind of prequel to Game of Thrones, which I really enjoyed, I have to say, I started off thinking, oh, you know, but then I, I really got into it and they do a lot with dragons and there's this wonderful image. And of course, this is in other popular books too, but they, they do this wonderful, uh, there's this wonderful thing where if you're uh, a Targaryen and you can speak, uh, what's the language, um, high, high Valerian or something, <laughs> you, you can... Um, you can sort of tame, a, you can find a dragon to you, and then you become a dragon rider, and uh, it's, it's this really uh, stupendous thing, and there are these aerial fights and all these great uh, 
uh, special effects. You see these kinds of swooping beasts in the air, bellowing loudly. Uh, and it's, but it, it's a wonderful image, I think, of just what we were saying that, that, you know, with the right relationship, you could have access to the vast life energy of the unconscious, of the creative unconscious that the dragon represents. Right. And the thing that they say when they approach the dragon in that uh, television series is, serve me. Ah, okay. And ah, the dragon, that's it, great. A number of the situations, the dragon looks up, considers, and then belches flame all <laughs> over the person who asks. Yeah. That, yes. That yes. if you're not the right kind yes, of uh, Targaryen, right it's not going to go well. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. So this calls up for me, you know, what is um, the right relationship uh, to, to dragons, to this aspect of the unconscious. And, and just as in fairy tales, there are a number of ways to relate to dragons, but you have to go in consciously. You can't just walk up to a dragon and say, hey, uh, serve me. Mm -hmm. But uh, Joseph, you and I were talking about, there is a theme of befriending this way, where like horse and rider, the, yes. the hero um, you know, is the one directing the forces of the dragon, the unconscious. And we were talking about the sci-fi series by Anne McCaffrey of uh, the dragons of Pern and mm -hmm. uh, the whole series that bar borrows from Conrad Lawrence, uh, Lorenz, L-O-R-E-N-Z, uh, who discovered how uh, chicks imprint and that when the chicks hatch, the first thing they see is what they will follow and consider uh, their, their guiding, more or less, maternal force. And uh, it was such a wonderful scene of people gathering around all the dragon eggs hatching, and that when the dragons hatch, you simply stand there and wait for one of these little baby dragons. Mm -hmm. They're so cute to make eye contact with you. And, and bond. Uh, so it's an interesting image of a kind of primal bonding with a baby dragon that you can befriend. Mm -hmm. Big dangerous ducks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another way is you can trick the dragon. Uh, aside from the usual uh, heroic uh, sword-piercing um, legends, there's a, a story, um, I think, in the Bible or one of the Apocrypha of uh, Daniel and um, this idol, and it's a dragon. And uh, the way that Daniel kills the dragon is by feeding it cakes made of pitch and hair and fat. And our greedy dragon gulps them all down, and um, then they explode in the dragon's stomach, which is a gloriously, um, really horrible, gory end to, to the dragon. So it, it calls up various ways of which dragon, what do I do, what are my options, how do I relate to this energy? And that, that reminds me of another very wonderful, wonderful scene of dragon lore in modern culture, which is Bilbo and Smog under the Lonely Mountain. And Smog, this is from The Hobbit. Uh, Smog is lying on his hoard of gold. <laughs> and Bilbo makes his way down into Smog's lair wearing the ring, which renders him invisible. And then he's able to kind of engage in this uh, repartee with Smog to gather more information and sort of incite Smog a little bit. And uh, it's not Smog's ultimate undoing, but it does, does begin that. So, so it's a wonderful uh, conversation that Bilbo and Smog have. And that what Bilbo needs to steal is the the jewel of the king. Yeah. So so the the dragon has 
you know, collected gold cups and coins and bracelets, but also has laid claim to the authority of kingship. Yeah. And the that, Arkenstone. The Arkenstone. So that Bilbo's going in with, as a trickster, as an incredible, um, confident trickster. It's, it's astounding that he isn't just passing out from anxiety to, to reclaim this kind of authority, which is what we were talking about, that something has fallen into the unconscious and that the, the kingly principle or the capacity for each of us to rule our own internal kingdom yes, great. has That's great. fallen into the hands of these unconscious instinctive impulses and, and consequently we're just ruled by our baser instincts. But most importantly, is that the Arkenstone has not been destroyed, even though the dragon is laying on it, because it doesn't want to kill, destroy those things. That's great. That's really great, Joseph. Yeah. Jung said that dreams are the guiding words of the soul. Dream School is our 12-month self-paced online program that teaches you how to understand these important messages from the unconscious. We break down the essential skills, teach you how to apply them, and offer opportunities for practice. You can become part of a vibrant community, join a dream group, or share your dream with other students. There are monthly live Q&As with Joseph, a chance for one-on-one time with Deb in her office hours, and monthly dream seminars with me, Lisa. Visit our website, thisjungianlife.com, to learn more or sign up. Yeah, in some ways, the, 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 the dragon is the keeper of these capacities, you know, and it's, you know, the image of the dragon is related to the image of the Ouroboros and one, one of the, that, which is the serpent eating its tail. Right. And part of the significance of the Ouroboros is that the, the, the unconscious can be self fertilizing. Exactly. It can act upon itself to generate something new. It's the opus, uh, the work, from within, um, that that it is within us uh, to guard and gestate uh, the the treasure, the treasure of the self, our our very our, our potential, our full potential, and that that goes back to what you were saying earlier of what's the treasure, and that there's treasure in the unconscious. It's the fount of creativity and intuition and freedom of expression and access to all the parts of ourselves. And, and that's why, Joseph, I think the point you just made is so important, that the dragon doesn't destroy the, the hoard. It doesn't destroy the treasure. And there's almost a paradoxical way in which the dragon is keeping it for us until we're ready to reclaim it. Which brings me to one of my favorite dragon quotes <laughs> by uh, the, the poet Rainer Maria Rilke who says, perhaps all the dragons in our lives are princesses who are only waiting to see us act just once with beauty and courage. Perhaps everything that frightens us is, in its deepest essence, something helpless that wants our love. I think that's a great quote that I would associate with the dragons of trauma. Oh, okay. That there are ways that we can be reduced to incredible instinctive states by overwhelming circumstances, and parts of ourselves are split off, precious parts of ourselves, and that we have to be courageous enough to reclaim it, much in the way Kalshat talks about the archetypal defenses. That those, I think, are a a different kind of dragon, they are absolutely guarding a treasure. Yes, yeah. The treasure could be our soul or various feelings, qualities that we've dissociated. And as Kalshad says so elegantly, we have to come before these guardians, the dragons, and somehow retire them with a gold watch. Mm-hmm, yeah. That's a quote from Don. Yes, yes. Um, because they've been doing a good job. It's just that we don't need them to guard the dissociated material anymore. And we need that beautiful potential to come back to us. 
but we are going to have to grow enough to face whatever it is that scares us away from knowing what we used to know. Mm. And on the one hand, dragons are guarding the treasure of our creativity and potential. On the other hand, if they're holding a princess captive, uh, the vulnerable, beautiful, soft part, um, and, and the dragon is not defeated, uh, some kind of vital energy uh, is devoured. And, then, and that won't be the end of it either. Um, you know, uh, then the dragons go rampaging around the countryside. Uh, gobbling up people um, here, there, and elsewhere. So in, we have no choice, really, but to confront the dragon. There's a beautiful Armenian fairy tale. It's very involved, but I'll, I'll see if I can just uh, summarize the beginning part of it. It's very long. It's called Sun, uh, Sun Girl and Dragon Prince. And it starts with a... a Kind of a Cinderella setup. This this girl has an evil stepmother, and the mother's the stepmother's very cruel to her and makes her do all of the work. And and there's also a prince who's been turned into a dragon by uh, by perhaps uh, another evil stepmother. I can't really remember. But um, the dragon devours a, a a noble girl every day, and they run out of noble girls. And yeah. so they, they take a limited um, supply, limited <laughs> supply. So they, they grab hold of, of Sun Girl because at that point she's been rewarded for her good deeds with um, shimmering golden hair. And they, they notice her and they grab her and they drop her into the dragon's lair. And she turns around and she speaks to him kindly. And he immediately um, begins weeping and turns into a prince. And then they're married, and that's only the beginning of the story. But um, but it's a it's just a beautiful image that it's just it's just her kindness that transforms the dragon of trauma. It's just a, a, a it's love. So there are ways that in the first half of life we have to defeat the dragon of wanting to collapse into passivity returning to this dependency on our parents to fight our way so we can stand on our own two hairy legs and kind of start a life. There's a way in which trauma can evoke dragons from the unconscious who will guard our dissociated material who have to be approached very creatively and at great cost to us. And then there are also the dragons that we have to submit to later on in life because part of the renewal in the second half of life is to be swallowed by our instincts, to face them with an ego that is muscular enough to feel them and tolerate them without acting out. So in alchemy, there's an image of a green dragon. Excuse me, a uh, <laughs> Sometimes it is a dragon, a green lion, sometimes a dragon devouring the sun, which is this experience of instincts surging up in midlife. And this is where we get the, uh, the idea of the midlife crisis, and we're running out getting facelifts and buying new red cars and having affairs. And in a sense, that's the resurgence of the life force in the instinctive self which brings us back to life. And this time, we have to feel all of those impulses and hold them in a muscular way that we can then purpose them. We can ride the dragon into mm -hmm. the second half yes. of life. Yeah, yeah. I really like um, that what you're saying and the word uh, facing the dragon in a muscular way which could be literally with uh, the proverbial sword of the hero. Uh, it could be figuring out um, a trick uh, like Daniel did. And it could be, you know, like you're saying, Lisa, with the fairy tale and the quote, by simply standing your ground with a muscular kind of love. 
not a, you know, sort of here kitty kitty kind no. of love, which isn't going to work. But here I am, ready to stand and engage uh, without giving ground, without giving way. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to bring up a, a really great image here. And this comes from the visions of Christiana Morgan, who worked with Jung for some time. And we recently did a podcast with Christiana's uh, granddaughter, Hillary Morgan. So you can go back and, and look at that. But she, she was an exceptional woman who, who engaged in Jung's practice of active imagination and created this incredible artwork based on her visions and uh, kept journals of her visions. And Jung was really inspired by her and uh, did a lot of work with her visions. So this is, I'm going to be reading a quote from uh, a book uh, by the Jungian analyst Claire Douglas about Christiana Morgan, and the title of the book is Translate This Darkness, and here's the quote. So she'd had a vision, Christiana had had a vision of a dragon. Christiana's vision showed her that a woman hero's task was not to kill the dragon, but to keep it alive, even as she separated herself from unconscious fusion with it and its power. Not okay to be fused with it. Through entering into conscious relation with her dark dragon, Christiana integrated its power inside herself. She redeemed her raging, fire-spitting dragon along with the treasure and brought both up to the surface. Crucially, she did not make the dragon nice or socially acceptable, nor did she kiss it in the hope that she would become a beautiful princess and live prettily and happily ever after with and for some man. She realized that a woman hero needed her dragon to stay a dragon. Christiana was doing difficult work because she dealt with images of the feminine that had not been put into words before and contradicted everything she had been taught about women. Wow. Yeah. But really important insight of one has to differentiate from the dragon, from the mm -hmm. primordial instincts, so that we don't become dangerous to everyone around us, then stay in that creative relationship. Now, this idea, which I, I'd love for you guys to chime in on, that the author of that book says that the individuating stance she was able to achieve is that she doesn't need to submit or be dependent on any man, but that yeah. she is she is something wildly and powerfully and creatively independent. Mm -hmm. So I think this is also a message for men in this generation, for men to also wake up to their own dragon and to be able to take a stance that your life isn't predicated upon serving the women around you. Yeah. That constantly looking to see what they mm. might need or be protected or whatever our fantasies are about that. But to be able to step back, not so much into the dragon, but perhaps into the wild man, which mm -hmm. Robert Bly talks mm. about, or the green man, or the hero. And for men to be able to ask, who am I when I am not pandering? To women. And I think that this idea for men and women in this age is, is enormously essential. Yeah. Yep. I think that's right on. So it really, what I'm thinking you've uh, touched on and brought up, Joseph, is uh, how, what is right relationship? How, how do we, whatever our dragons are, challenges in life, our own inner world that is still hasn't been sorted out, is still, you know, got some feet in the primeval. What how do we do this? How do we maintain the relationship with all of that material and differentiate ourselves from it? And I think Lisa, the clue was in what you read from Claire Douglas about Christiana Morgan of 
uh, that she had this relationship with the dragon and it could still remain a dragon. Mm -hmm. So she didn't. She wasn't fused with it. Right. She wasn't fused. She wasn't enmeshed. And neither did she just reject it and try to slam the door on it and tell it to go away. But uh, we are going to have to keep on dealing with each other. And, of course, we tend to have relationships that are uh, enmeshed uh, with others that represent and touch on our own internal world. Sure. So what I think of what, from what you're both saying is that it's sort of translating into what it might look like in a person's life is, and, and Joseph, I really appreciate what you're saying about men. I definitely see that, you know, the, the, the women's version of it though m- might look something like if a woman's fused with her dragon, she might be nasty and bitter and resentful and constantly kind of carping and criticizing and, uh, you know, putting, putting her, her partner down, let's say. Um, that's not, that's destructive. That's the destructive dragon. Then you're a victim of the dragon. Mm -hmm. But if you can, if you can not fuse with it, but, but don't shut it away and turn it into something nice and pretty where you're, you're just, uh, you know, shoving your feelings aside. If you let the dragon be a dragon and you have a relationship with the dragon, then you can sort of stand and say, this is, this is, you know, this is what I want. Let's have a conversation about it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think, I think what, we're all, what we're all saying is men and women should both be doing that. Yes. And you're right to say it looks different. For men that are yeah, yeah. captured by the dragon, they keep turning, without realizing it, turning all women into mother figures. Yes. And, and pressing them yes. to take care of yes. their needs, pressing them to, to be maternal vessels. Yep. And, and, and that the, one of the prime, I mean, going back to what we started with earlier, like Tiamat, I mean, I think that that, that goes, you have to kill the mother dragon. That's the first stage of developing an ego. You have to kill the mother. Exactly. And which yeah. is what Freud noticed in terms of repression, yes. that you've got to just take this stuff out of the long-term goals. If I could only find a woman to do all of these things for yeah. me. Then I'll be really happy. Right. And so one of the ways in the more ancient world that people did better about this is they had powerful same sex communities. Mm-hmm. So that men mm-hmm. could rely on men <sighs> for much of their needs and women can rely on women for much of their needs and come together in ways that are creative and life affirming. Women have that still and men really don't. You know, since the Industrial Revolution and men mm. I should say Why women can create that easily for themselves. They have book clubs or something, but men don't tend to. No, which I think is, again, the vestige of the dragon. Because yeah. they get married, they go to work, they come home, and the wife is the best friend and the mother of the children and the lover and the confidant and becomes everything in the same way that mm-hmm. the mother was mm-hmm. to the boy. Because the mother is the companion to the three-year-old boy. She is the one where everything goes to. Well, I mean, I'm certainly that for my son. And always will be. I see that smile on your face. (laughs) (laughs) He's never going to leave me. (laughs) You know, and fathers are also out of the house. So your mother does become your primary companion, your friend, the person you're around. There's a lot of, a lot of, ideas about how this might change. But honestly, I think that if both mom and dad split the time, each one is working, you know, 25 hours a week away from the house. Dad's there half the time taking care of those kids. Mom's there half the time taking care of those kids. Then your kids will know you as a father. And the sense of being companioned by the masculine and the feminine would be in the psyche. That's great. That's great. And um, there is also the powerful archetypal reality that undergirds all of this. Uh, That the archetype of the mother and the father are incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. And uh, kids that were raised in good 
you know, there used to be um, some stories about like Boys Town, um, where uh, there were no mothers, but the mother archetype is nonetheless yeah. present. I mean, certainly and is there devouring were... in nature because it it is it is the creative unconscious which can give right. birth and destroy. Yeah. Yes, and the the maternal principle is simply there, regardless of whether caretakers are uh, male or female, and the task of separating remains. I love the fact that we started with dragons and somehow we're into like the roles of the sexes and child rearing. It's just, but it's, it's all there, right? That's, that's Jung's idea that the dragon is, is the primal experience that human beings have. So we have to talk about developmental psychology to, to ground it. Yeah. And what does that mean inside of us? Mm -hmm. And, and when we think about, humans that really turn us off or shock us, if we squint our eyes, they're basically behaving like toddlers. <laughs> they're yelling, they're making commands. One of my friends uh, is a great story. He's um, just got married and his wife had um, a three-year-old child. And so the three-year-old girl comes into the house one day and slams the door and she goes, I own everything. <laughs> <laughs> He'd never had a child. He was like, I have no idea what to was, do. Yes. She was a little uh, dragon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yep. when we see that happening in an adult who's 40 or 50 or 60, walking around belching, male or female, I own mm -hmm. everything. It's not so cute. I mean, no. it doesn't make us laugh so much. It is but not we cute. Can see that it comes from that unresolved relationship to the dragon. Mm -hmm. And the seduction mm -hmm. of the dragon has never been broken. Yes, yes. So we do have dragons inside, of like this little girl. You know, it's all mine. <laughs> I have the horde. Mm -hmm. we, can, we all can breathe fire in angry enactments that we might later regret. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it goes, the inner battle of, of ego and choice and consciousness uh, over the ever-present primordial instincts mm -hmm. that continue to exist in us. Mm -hmm. And we see dragons out there all the time of people and the, the awful tragic consequences of inner dragons that were not uh, tamed, defeated, um, mastered in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see recently these school shootings and that have happened yet again. And we have, you know, your boy, your, your teenage boy who you love and seems like an average teenage boy, and this primordial force comes up and overtakes the ego, overtakes the moral stance, and compels kids who don't have the muscularity of ego mm -hmm. to be able to say no to the primal impulse to kill. Yeah. So it, it take, It's a whole stage of development to get to the point where you can have a conscious generative relationship with your dragon. Yeah. And it um, sparks in me the idea that uh, we sort of uh, touched on slightly, which is um, it takes companions sometimes that the hero, you know, like Beowulf, for example, goes to kill uh, Grendel the Grendel, dragon. Yes. And he has companions who help him. Mm hmm. Um, so sometimes those companions are steadfast, and sometimes at the last minute they uh, hightail it on out of the cave, uh, the dragon's lair. But but it does um, evoke this image of the a boy like some of these school shooters, and they're teenagers. You know, they're not men; they're young men, adolescents, boys. And they need uh, companions. 
They, they need support. Uh, it's too soon for them to be trying to do the developmental work all alone. And by all alone, I don't mean living in the forest in a hut, but alone, unseen, unrecognized, not communicated well enough with, uh, unseen in some basic relational way. Right. But our, our boys have to be claimed. Mm. They have to be gathered up. And even though your boy says, no, no, leave me alone. Yeah. There needs to be something strong enough in the culture, the parents, but also the community to pull them into relationship and not allow them to stay in the grip of the dragon. And to teach them how to hunt. Mm -hmm. Which was, you know, from time immemorial, uh, men taught other men, young men coming up, how to do this. Right, which is about life skills, yes. this ability to provide for oneself, yeah. Today's dreamer is a 25-year-old male who works in food service, and the title is The Four Dragons. I am in my parents' house with all my immediate family. In the dream, my parents, both my siblings and I, are all about 15 years younger than we are in real life. Making my parents about 40, my brother and sister around 13 and 12 respectively, and myself 10 years old. All five of us are frantically trying to batten down the house, locking every window, barricading every door because we know that a dragon is coming. <laughs> Joseph. We do not know what the dragon plans to do, but we know that we must protect ourselves. As I am pushing an armoire in front of the French doors at the back of the house, <laughs> I hear the great beating wings and see through the door that the sunny backyard is now in shadow. I know that the dragon has arrived. I pray out loud to God that he protects our house from the dragon, that no flame will catch, and that the walls and roof will not collapse. As I complete my prayer, I feel certain that it has been heard, and our house will be protected. My family and I gather by the back doors to listen as the dragon begins to speak. It mocks us in a deep, booming voice, <laughs> saying we are weak and wicked. And my mother begins to dissemble my barricade, and I can't stop her. She's gathered small plastic berries that might be used as Christmas decorations, and now outside is throwing the berries into the air as if to hit the dragon. She's angry and determined to harm it. And I beg her to come back inside, telling her this will not help and that she's putting herself in danger. She returns inside. I begin to move the armoire back in place when next to me, my mother opens a window and jumps through. Oh my gosh. She leaps into the air and transforms herself into a dragon. I crossed to the front of the house to watch in awe. I did not know she could do this. <laughs> My mother is a cerulean blue dragon, serpent-like, and long as a bus, resembling those from Chinese mythology. The first dragon is golden and much larger than her, maybe five times her size, and looks more like a creature from European myth with four legs and great webbed wings. There is one other dragon, identical to my mother, but crimson red. I know that the red dragon is more malicious than the golden one, but not as powerful. I watch all three fly high into the air, twisting and writhing, as my mother leads them away from our house and out over the sea. In the dream, the house is on a beach. Out above the water, my mother reverses her flight, to face her pursuers 
and wraps herself around them both. All three plunge into the water and disappear. I know this has done great damage to all of them, but I feel that they will soon return. Suddenly, my understanding of the circumstances has changed. I now know that we are all protecting my brother. The dragons have come for him, because he can transform into a dragon too. He is very afraid and hiding in his bedroom. My sister and my father are ambivalent to the situation, and my mother has not returned from the water, so I must protect my brother alone. I turn to the back of the house to see the French doors open again. I try desperately to close and barricade them. As I get the armoire black in place, I sense that the golden dragon has returned overhead. Close my eyes and pray again for God's protection. When I open my eyes, I am my older brother in his bedroom. I'm desperately afraid and I hear the dragon's mocking voice calling for me to join it. I feel that it wishes to harm me, but it is not saying this. Despite my fear and my desire to stay inside, I cannot help but transform. I am pulled through the roof as if it is insubstantial, and I am in the open air above the house flying on emerald wings. I look just like the golden dragon, but green and much smaller, about the size of a compact car. I cannot see the larger dragon, but I know it is circling above me, and I feel its condescension at my fear. It is slow and confident, and will catch me soon, although I am not sure of what harm it wishes to do me. I close my eyes and pray to be returned to the safety of the house, but I know I cannot get back. I feel the golden dragon descend upon me, and I wake in terror. Ah, such a dream. Goodness. a great dream. For context, the dreamer writes, I am close with my mother and sister, but only recently have reconnected with my father after a few years without contact. My brother and I have not spoken in over a year since he revealed that his developing faith and my homosexuality were at odds. On Christmas, my mother informed me that my brother and his wife are expecting their first child. He says his main feelings in the dream were fear, dread, insignificance, and frustration at my own size and strength, awe. And he offers uh, a few associations. Though I am a fan of fantasy, I do not have any particularly unique relationship or understanding of dragons. At the age of ten years old, my home was comfortable and my family was stable. Boy, that armoire keeps coming back and back. <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but I'm like thinking about why the armoire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's the bulwark mm-hmm. against mm-hmm. the dragon over and over again. Well, it's just such a, it's such a um, kind of, oh, I don't know, vividly, vivid dream and very well told too. I'm really appreciating that, uh, that the dreamer really um, captured it very well and appreciating that. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> but but the, the armoire is that the first um, impulse on the part of the dream ego is is barricading is right. hiding hiding De- it's mm-hmm. a defense mm-hmm. it's a defense against this numinous potential right it's but it's not running away i mean there are lots of ways we can defend each uh, ourselves but i think it's interesting to block the door to hide to to withdraw mm-hmm. basically well and kind of create a barrier and create a barrier um, you know, very much like in the story of the three little pigs, you know, eventually the third pig builds a house of, of brick that is impermea- impermeable uh, to the wolf. So here we have a dragon in that same role of attacking, invading, penetrating, and uh, let's, let's just shore up the walls. Um, and an armoire has lots of size. and. It plays on the word arm and being mm-hmm. armed, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know. 
But that that's um, chapter number one, and he prays out loud to God. So seek help from without. Um, but Mom uh, is pretty willing to go out there and confront She's the dragon. Get out there one way or the other. Yeah the the first her, the first effort of um, this dream figure of little plastic berries and isn't that nice and they could be Christmas decorations. So, <laughs> but what he didn't know is that his mother can transform into a dragon. Um, I think all mothers can do this. <laughs> but it's so interesting, right? Because here's the mythology of Tiamat and Marduk. Right? Say, say more about that. Well, his mother's a dragon. Ah. His mother's a dragon. Yeah. And, and what's, what's being asked of him in the dream is to find his own dragon self. Yeah. Uh, but it's... Uh, uh, Chapter number two, first you barricade, um, pray to God, and then um, you hope for protection from, in this case, mom, Mm -hmm. uh, who can transform into a cerulean blue dragon, serpent-like, and as long as a bus. And and, and by the way, this this more sort of uh, eastern dragon, which is more associated with, uh, you know. right. Right. The, the positive pole of the archetype. So um, the, the story goes on. Um, there are more dragons. Mom uh, engages with the dragons and um, like a good, you know, like a, a bird um, is a decoy. She leads the other dragons away from her vulnerable uh, offspring in the house. Is that what she's doing? That I mean, that's interesting. I wonder what the... That that does seem possible, that, that that's the purpose of it. Uh, she says, um, my mother leads them away from our house and out over the sea. Mm-hmm. And to, then... To sort of protect the family, yeah. And, yeah, and then she um, reverses her flight to face her pursuers and wraps herself around both of them, and they plunge into the water and disappear. So this is great. I mean, this could be a movie. Of these bad dragons battling over the ocean, yeah, yeah. plunging All into the water. these beautiful colors. They sound so beautiful. Crimson and gold and cerulean and emerald. So after this is where the, there's a change. Um, so uh, this has done great damage to them all. And then he says, suddenly my understanding of the circumstances has changed. I now know we're all protecting my brother. Mm-hmm. And they've come to him because he can transform into a dragon, too. But Brother is afraid, hiding in his bedroom. Uh, Mom has not come back, so our dream ego has to protect his brother all by himself. And now those French doors are open again. Uh, Got to try to reestablish the barricade with the, with the armoire. Um, back to the beginning, the golden dragon has returned, closes his eyes and prays again. And then, aha, I am my older brother in his bedroom. Oh, my goodness. The brother and the dream ego are one. And uh, he says, I'm desperately afraid. The dragon's mocking voice is calling. I feel it wishes to harm me, but is not saying this. Despite my fear and my desire to stay inside, I cannot help but transform. And then he's pulled through the roof and flying on emerald wings. I look just like the golden dragon, but green and smaller, about the size of a compact car. So uh, (laughs) it's really uh, charming. Uh, So I, I think... Here is the story of the dream. And to me, just jumping forward a bit, um, this is a story about puberty and Ah. sexuality. Mm. And, you know, the brother is 13 and the dragons are coming for him. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And sooner or later, he's 10, he's going to be 13, and the dragons will come for him too. Ah. And he's going to be full of all kinds of, passion and turbulence and difficulty and 
from his perspective, he looks and he's praying to God, this isn't going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. And the idea that God wants us to all remain virginal and sexually undeveloped because purity is, is the best thing. And that it seems the mother's role is, is interesting and complicated. Yes. He thinks that the mother is trying to keep the dragons away from him. Mm-hmm. And that he, she's going out and she's taunting the dragon, but she can't stay away from it. And when mom and the dragon start writhing, they look exactly like snakes that are mating. Mm. And if you, if you look at images of snake pits when they're all mating, they're winding around each other in this kind of erotic frenzy. So it's a little unclear about what mom wants, uh, wants the attention from the dragon, but clearly... In the dream, he can't understand why anybody would want to be a dragon or want to be with a dragon and and how the dragon is something that's just so terrible to a 10-year-old boy. We have a 25-year-old boy alienated from his father. He's working in food service. I don't know whether that was what he longed for. Does he have access? to his own sexual desires? Is he out there in the world, you know, contending in the way that he wants to? He says that he's gay, but is he actualized that way, or is he retreated into the world of the mother too much, and that something needs to come and call him out of the house? He, um, you know, he says a bunch of times, I think the dragon wants to hurt me, although he never says that. So he's really being summoned, Joseph, which I think really goes to your point. He's being summoned to, I want to say, something like a larger destiny, whether that's to to live out his sexuality, but but perhaps also to actualize himself in other ways as well. And the dragon may be his father, Mm -hmm. you know, who's just come back into his life and is, you know, big and scary. You know, it's not uncommon that if there's an ugly divorce, and moms are really angry at their dads, and the children, little boys, bonded with their mom, see dad as negative and maybe even dangerous or inscrutable, but very, very negative. So that when a boy needs to be able to look at men and not be afraid of them, or look at men and not feel his mother's contempt, he can't find that in himself. He can't find a way to look at men and think well of them, or want to be close to them. So that's a big piece of work of reclaiming that I think the dream is trying to bring forward. What I was paying attention to is uh, sort of the the hero's journey here. Uh, You know, pray to God, uh, barricade the walls with the armoire, etc., etc., but that uh, eventually he realizes that he and his brother are one and he does answer the call. He, he goes up. He can't, he can't not. He doesn't answer the call. He's pulled into it. Right. But, but he, that to my mind, that is a really positive image of that. You too have access to your dragon nature and he's a smaller. Um, and, He's still afraid, um, but he's out there flying around with with the dragons and claiming and claiming that he's no longer hiding in the house trying to um, block what is going on. Uh, so I think it's a really positive uh, image, you know, and especially his having to come to terms with his homosexuality. Of, of that claiming uh, and, and what it means in the family context and uh, nevertheless, you know, being a dragon of this is my nature. Yeah, yes, this is my nature. This is my nature. 
That last sentence says it all. I close my eyes and pray to be returned to the safety of the house, (laughs) but I know I cannot get back. Like, it's over. Like, running back to mom is is done, and you're out there contending with other dragons and spreading your wings, just as you were saying, Deb. Right. And needing, you feel small, but you need to be out of the house. And I love that one of the feelings in the dream toward the end is awe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. I was just going back to take a look at where the brother is in the dream. Oh, he has to protect his brother. So it's interesting that in waking life, it's the brother um, who is uh, on the verge of some kind of rejection of our dreamer. But but in the dream, uh, the dream ego has to protect the older brother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there's power there. Right. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.